On Tech News Today, smartphone leader Samsung reports another miserable quarter. Plus, Microsoft comes out with its hotly anticipated fitness band. Flipboard comes out with a new topic-centered approach to content. And Apple CEO Tim Cook just comes out. Don't go anywhere. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, October 30th, 2014. Tech News Today is a show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin, and Anthony Nielsen is controlling everything. Is he, you have a very controlling personality, Anthony. That's uh, yes, why yes. you're so good at this. Yeah. Always uh, <laughs> quiet and just take care of business. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for stepping in between our Jasons. Uh, and it's uh, Thursday, so we have Elise Hugh as our co-anchor. Welcome to you, Elise Hugh. Happy to be here. Great, great to be here again, Mike, and welcome back. Thank you so much. And uh, speaking of people going to other places, you just got assigned to the Plum O the Century. Can you tell us about your your new uh, promotion and 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 uh, assignment? I had to go get it. I had to get a hint. Yay! Oh, that, that's the best Korea. But you're going to be in the other Korea, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're opening up a new bureau for NPR in Seoul, South Korea, but um, my reporting responsibilities will include both Koreas and Japan. So that's sort of beginning of 2015. I get to head out there and plant a new flag for the company. It's really exciting. Do you even speak Korean? Nope. Okay, so so another another dimension to this uh, to to the adventure there. <laughs> that's right. A new language now. Com uh, just to being put this completely illiterate. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, you got to start somewhere. So uh, you'll be <laughs> speaking uh, fluently by soon enough, I'm sure. Um, so just to put this into context, because this is like such a plum assignment for a technology uh, journalist, because uh, for two reasons. First of all, they're opening a bureau, so you're you're opening the bureau. So it's not like you're stepping into an existing bureau. So that's always a great thing. Uh, in journalism when you get to, you know, go out and open a new bureau. But the covering technology in, in Korea and Japan is like, it's like having the car beat in Germany and Italy or something like that. It's, it's like really a sweet part of the world to cover technology. Yeah, I'm really excited, especially about the fastest internet in the world because I can push deadline a little bit more or I could be a little bit more efficient. So I don't know what it is. I'm, li I'm likely just going to procrastinate that much longer because my my ability to file will be so fast. Yeah, exactly. That's right. You get an extra, you know, 20 minutes or whatever. Yeah, I'm a big <laughs> fan of Korea. I love Seoul. You know, and Seoul um, street food is just like amazing food. It's like Korean barbecue and stuff. It's just like so good. You're going to have a great Can't time. Can't wait. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. All right. Well, let's jump into the news. Samsung had a tough earnings call yesterday. Mobile profits dropped 74% year over year. Phil Goldstein is the editor of Fierce Wireless, and Shard Tibkin is a senior writer at CNET, and both of them join us right now. Welcome to both of you. Hey, guys. Now, Phil, why the big drop in mobile profits? What's going on? Well, I think that they are getting a lot of competition from uh, the lower end of the market, the entry-level market, especially from competitors in China uh, like Xiaomi, uh, Lenovo, Huawei, ZTE. Uh, they mentioned in their earnings report that they basically uh, saw a drop in the average selling price of their smartphones, uh, in part because they cut prices on some older models or some existing models, and in part because they were putting more entry and mid-level phones into the market to try to offset some of this competition that they're seeing. Uh, and, you know, when you sell cheaper phones uh, that have a lower margin, uh, you're going to see your profits drop. But I think that Samsung feels like they have to respond to the incredibly intense competition that they're seeing in the market. Shara, are there any bright spots here for Samsung? Any sort of silver lining they tried to point out? Uh, I mean, they pointed out that tablets are doing well. Um, their chip business has kind of been a savior for them for quite a while, and I think that that's going to continue continue that way. Um, this quarter, though, things were pretty rough across the board. Uh, the TV business did, didn't do as well as they expected. Um, home appliances didn't do very well because, I guess, uh, it got cold earlier, so they weren't selling as many air conditioners. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's pretty tough for them right now. 
Shara, despite the doom and gloom, uh, Samsung still has twice the market share of Apple and is still one of the two significantly profitable companies in the handset market. My view on this is that essentially uh, Samsung had a very early lead. They really went strong globally. Um, I've traveled all over the world and everywhere you go, you see Samsung as by far the leading uh, uh, marketed smartphone platform. I've seen it in Africa. I've seen, I saw it in Jordan. Uh, all over the world, they really push for the third world, and then they sort of, as people make that transition to higher-end phones and better smartphones, they are already Samsung loyal. So they're pretty successful uh, as a company. They've got a lot going for them. Do you think that they're going to be able to uh, turn this around? And if they are, how do you think they're going to do it? Well, I mean, you pointed out that they're in a lot of areas, and they really have pushed. Um, Samsung basically wants to be everything for everyone. They want to not only sell high-end phones, but they want to sell mid-range. They want to sell low-end. Um, you know, as Phil mentioned, like the low-end is an area that is pretty tough for them right now. And the issue there is that they were trying to sell kind of old, kind of crappy phones um, for cheap prices, whereas like Xiaomi and some of these other guys are making really high-end phones or, you know, moderately high-end phones, but they're selling them for really cheap. So Samsung really has to figure out, you know, whether it wants to m remain the market share leader and just really have, you know, huge market share, or if it wants to go more with the Apple strategy, which is we're just going to focus on these certain segments of the market and make a lot of money from them, but not worry about necessarily being number one in smartphones. And I think for Samsung, the struggle for them is, you know, they they want to be number one in everything, you know, that they have all these goals. And, um, you know, it was a really big deal for them when they surpassed Nokia to become the biggest phone maker. Um, but, you know, they even said yesterday that they're going to try to focus a little more. So, you know, I think it's going to be hard for them to do that. We're going to have to see how that happens for them. Phil, what do you think? Do you expect Samsung will be able to successfully go from mass to more niche? Well, I agree a lot uh, with a lot of what Shara just said. And I think that uh, they mentioned and kind of indicated in their earnings release that they might try to slim down or rationalize their portfolio or make sure that uh, they were delivering sort of uh, unique experiences, varying price points. Um, they do have this incredibly bewildering array of smartphones. I think The Verge um, a couple of months ago did a really cool feature about how it's basically impossible to tell all the different Galaxy uh, phones apart from each other because there are just so many of them. Um, but I think that, you know, Shara is right, that they're going to have to decide what's more important to them, whether or not they really need to uh, in um, such a huge lead in market share, or whether they can afford to sacrifice uh, if that's going to mean higher margins and higher profits for them, as Apple, you know, has very evidently um, been willing to do over the years. Uh, or whether or not they're going to try to basically fine-tune the strategy that they've had, which is cell phones to everybody at a very wide range of price points, um, but um, you know, basically just up the you know up the competition where they're getting uh, the heat right now at the low end of the market. And I think that uh, they have the resources. They certainly have the internal supply chain to be able to do that probably better than any other company in the world. But, uh, you know, I think that they're going to start to see a lot more competition. We just saw uh, this morning that Lenovo uh, closed their acquisition of Motorola Mobility. So they are now, according to research firm Strategy Analytics, the number three smartphone player uh, in the world in terms of market share behind Samsung and Apple. Uh, and they're not going away either. So it's going to be um, you know, tough for Samsung, I think, to uh, maintain their strategy without doing quite a bit of refinement. Phil Goldstein is at FierceWireless.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Fierce Wireless. Thanks for joining us, Phil. Thanks for having me, Mike. And, of course, Shara Tipkin is at CNET.com, and she's at Shara Tipkin on Twitter. Thank you for joining us, Shara. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, at least uh, Tim Cook announced a couple of things in the last two months, but it sounds like he had one more thing to announce. 
This is the news heard around the world this morning. Um, Tim Cook announced he's gay in a coming out column in Bloomberg Business Week. Um, he says that while most of us have already known it, he's never publicly acknowledged it. And so he did um, because he thought maybe it would help if the Apple CEO um, was out for folks who might still be struggling with their sexuality. So um, Lisa Fleischer, who is a tech reporter, London-based tech reporter for the Wall Street Journal, joins us to talk a little bit about it. Lisa. I, I want to know what your source's reaction is to this. Is this a just a giant shrug or um, does this have bigger effects than we expected? Um, I think it depends on how old people are, um, frankly, I think that and where you're living. So a lot of people in Silicon Valley are, you know, kind of like a big shrug, kind of like, well, why didn't he talk about this sooner? Or, you know, maybe why should he talk about it? Or for some people, it's important that he does talk about it because that you know it, it, it brings it out into the open and sort of makes um, makes the situation okay. But for others, uh, maybe for some uh, people who were formerly CEOs or people who are uh, my parents' generation, perhaps uh, it, it's it's a really momentous event when a business leader will come out, um, especially one in charge of a company as big as Apple, and uh, just say you know I'm gay. And uh, that's a really big deal for them. For example, um, one of the reactions in London was that there was uh, the former CEO of BP, um, a guy named John Brown, had been in the closet for much of his life and was actually forced to resign from his post in connection with some allegations about his personal life. Um, and he wrote, later wrote a book talking about how you know, he wished he had sort of done this sooner. And he, he made a statement today saying, how important um, Tim Cook's actions were. Now, on the one hand, this is just great news because basically, I mean, Tim Cook is, he presides over the world's most valuable company. He has been, he's already proved himself as being extremely good. Uh, I think uh, there was an interview today with uh, Representative Barney Frank, who is also openly gay, uh, who basically said that it's great timing because if he would have come out of the closet right as he took over as CEO, then the homophobes and so on would have attacked him and, and, and all this uh, kind of thing. But in this case, he's proved that he's just like really good at his job, that he's incredibly uh, high, you know, he's, he's a super great CEO. And now he comes out and it's like, what do you, you know, what are, what are the haters going to say? Uh, but on the other hand, I have to uh, be a little cynical. As a journalist, I mean, after their most recent announcement, there was a lot of uh, chatter on Twitter about the fact that at every Apple announcement, every single person on stage is a white male. And mm -hmm. he made a big point in his uh, Bloomberg article about how he was a minority. And I can't help but think that maybe that may have had something to do with the timing. Um, what do you think about that? That's interesting. Um, I hadn't really heard a lot of that chatter. What I did hear was complaints about the iPhone bending. Um, <laughs> so I think that perhaps maybe if people wanted to draw a line there and talk about changing the conversation in that way. Um, but just a point before what we were making about Barney Frank, um, can I just say, if anybody else is watching that CNBC interview, he was he said he rushed onto air so quickly that he didn't even put socks on. <laughs> so it was <laughs> oh, a great Barney Frank, <laughs> I miss him from Congress already. Um, yeah, and so, and, and you know, Tim Cook has been um, outspoken on gay issues in the past. So, for example, he talks about workplace discrimination, and he mentioned that in his op-ed as well, saying that in many states you can be fired just for being gay. And he wrote an op-ed for The Wall Street Journal in support of a bill that would outlaw that um, last year. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a momentous uh, uh, event, I guess, globally, uh, but only in the places where uh, this is, uh, you know, a legal issue where it's a cultural issue, certainly not in Silicon Valley, but it's, uh, I think it's just overall good news. Lisa Fleischer is at WSJ.com and you can follow her on Twitter at Lisa Fleischer. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. Thanks. Well, Microsoft today unveiled its hotly anticipated fitness wearable device, which they're calling Microsoft Band. The watch goes on sale today for 199 bucks. Let's take a look at their promotional video. How many do we miss? Tied to our desks looking down at our phones, plugged in. We call them moments because they don't last, and we don't know their value until they're gone. So make the most of every moment. The 
ones that make you smile. Notifications. Make you proud. Uh, yeah, alerts and uh, messaging. And of course, fitness. Inspire you. So we get the idea. Um, if you get this watch, you're going to be 20-something and very fit. Uh, no question about it. Uh, Elise Hugh, this, is, this watch actually looks really great. Um, and um, I, I, I can't help but uh, notice that it has some weird sensors. For example, it has a UV sensor to tell you if you're getting sunburn. It has a, um, a stress sensor to tell you if you're super stressed out. Um, I think that uh, for those of us in the journalism business, we're not going to make much use of the UV sensor, but we will use the stress sensor. What do you think of this watch? Does this have a chance to compete against um, the other fitness bands and maybe even the Apple watch? Now, I haven't been to business school, but from what I understand, so much of entrepreneurship and sort of launching products has to do with the timing that you get your product to market, right? And so my my first reaction when I was reading about this was, geez, is this too late? And so that's kind of question number one. Two, I am excited um, that wearables are advancing like technologically in general. Um, stress sensors are cool. Uh, <laughs> this this gets really complicated because th this is more power or more information for us to misread. So yeah. I'm really I'm really interested on how it either prompts us to act or not act based on, you know, this one indicator that Microsoft tells us is important. So yeah. B bigger behavioral and cultural questions I have, as usual. Yeah. And there are a couple of other points to uh, to communicate about this, which is that, uh, first of all, they make a big deal of, of the fact that you're supposed to put the display on the inside of your wrist. Uh, this is kind of unique. Uh, and we've all seen those those. Those, those guys, you know, with the watch with it, where they wear it on the inside just because they want to be different or whatever. Uh, but that's apparently how this is designed to be used. And I guess that makes sense. It looks like it makes sense from the video and so on. Uh, it tracks both uh, sleep and exercise. It gets 48 hours on a single charge. And I think the most interesting thing about this by far is the fact that it supports iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. So, for example, you know, the, the Android Wear devices are only for Android the Apple Watch is only for iPhone users. This is the watch, like some of the other fitness bands, actually. But this is this is a watch for multiple platforms, and I think that's a very, very cool thing. And it's going to have, of course, it has an app uh, for each of those platforms. So I'm optimistic. I think this is uh, this is pretty cool. It's interesting that they're breaking out of the walled garden because it seems to flow with the trend that Satya Nadella has been trying to set, which is you can get more Microsoft products in more places um, than previously under other regimes. So um, business-wise, I do think that's an interesting move as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, Elisa, it looks like a popular content app just got a little better. Yeah, Flipboard. Flipboard 3.0 is out and it's changing its orientation to topics before stories. It's letting users choose channels of interest like tech or politics or style um, before then showing particularly uh, particular items to read or watch. To talk about it, we've got Harry McCracken, tech editor for Fast Company. Harry, hello. Hey there. It's great to be with you. Well, first, tell us how this um, app works or how the improvements to Flipboard work. Well, in the old days, Flipboard had an arch rival. That, that was an app called Zeit, which was also a personalized magazine reader. Uh, but Zeit had a lot more computer science beneath the surface. It crawled the web and found articles and knew what topics they were about. And earlier this year, Flipboard bought Zeit. And it said at the time it was going to incorporate the Zeit technology into Flipboard, and, and now it has. So um, Flipboard was always beautiful. And now it's, it's more intelligent about finding articles for you not and not requiring you to go in and say, I like to read this news source and that news source. Now, uh, this uh, Flipboard was an early innovator in terms of the user interface, uh, Harry. And, and in its sort of history, it has been controversial in the sense that uh, there's been a battle between who gets the ad revenue. Uh, between the content producers who, you know, basically creating the articles that are being displayed w within it and, uh, and Flipboard itself. Is that still an issue? How, are they, how have they resolved that if, in fact, they have resolved it? I think it's settled down a little bit. Um, my previous employer, Time Inc., for a while did not really want to work with Flipboard, but even they came on board and are collaborating on, on some stuff. And, uh, you know, if, if Flipboard does not have a deal with a publisher, it sends you to the website of that publisher to read the article, so the original ads are still there. And if they do have a deal with a publisher, which they, which they do with a lot of them, including Fast Company, um, you see the article with a more beautiful presentation, 
And if there's any advertising, that, that, that revenue is split between Flipboard and the, the publisher. And are there are they experimenting with 3.0 in terms of other um, revenue streams here as well? Are they introducing anything new? The revenue stream is still pretty much what it was. I mean, this might be good for revenue overall, though, because in the past, Flipboard was wonderful as long as you took the time to hook it into your social networks and tell it what publications you liked. Um, that bar has been lowered a lot. And I think people who kind of couldn't figure out Flipboard in the past might find it a lot more accessible now. And if, if that happens, they might read more stuff. And if they read more stuff, they'll probably end up seeing more ads. Now, Harry, you're a thoughtful commentator on culture in general, in addition to being a kick-ass tech journalist. And you, um, does this bother you that innovation in these sorts of apps is headed in the direction away from what used to exist for newspapers and magazines? And what I mean by that is this new feature of, of being topic-centric enables people to narrowly uh, focus on a small number of areas that they're interested in and completely ignore other areas. When you used to subscribe to a newspaper or magazine, you were forced to confront all kinds of different uh, types of content uh, that would broaden your mind to a certain extent. Are we, is technology bringing us into this, uh, I guess they call it a filter bubble or something like that, where everybody's going to sort of be blind to uh, topic areas outside of their core interests? Well, it could happen, although I, I think Flipboard also works another way, and that is particularly with this new technology, you will see news sources um, that you haven't been reading in the past and maybe didn't even know existed to, to a much greater degree be, because this technology is finding stuff from all over the web. Um, it also is still finding links from pe people on your social network, which might be some things you weren't looking for. And they also have something called the Daily Edition, which, which is a very straightforward newspaper in Flipboard form, and that has all the standard sections like, like politics and sports and so forth. Um, and that's not tailored to you. That, that's one publication which goes out to everybody in, in the way that newspapers did. Interesting. Harry McCracken is at fastcompany.com, technologizer.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Harry McCracken. Thanks for joining us, Harry. Thanks, Mike. All right, we've got a few updates for you. Lenovo's $2.9 billion deal to buy Motorola's mobility unit from Google was completed this morning. Motorola will be a subsidiary of Lenovo and keep its headquarters in Chicago. Google kept the Motorola patents, of course, and will license some of them to Lenovo. And messaging apps keep coming up with new perks to attract users. Now Google is offering Hangouts users free one-minute calls to phone numbers in more than two dozen countries. After the free minute runs out, the calls will be charged the normal Google rate. Meanwhile, WhatsApp is apparently struggling to implement the voice calling service it promised for the second quarter of this year. Now the company's CEO, Jan Coombe, says they're hoping to roll it out in the first quarter of next year. And Google Wallet has been updated with the ability to make recurring bank transfers and low balance alerts. The update for both iOS and Android hits this week for U.S. users. Everyone knows the world's biggest smartphone sellers are Samsung and Apple, but now China's Xiaomi has moved into the number three spot, as Phil Goldstein said in our first seg uh, segment. This is according to new reports by Strategy Analytics and IDC. Still, the company's pretty far behind the leader. Samsung has a quarter of the market. Apple has about half of that, 12, around a little over 12%, and Xiaomi has about half of that, about 6%. And a little bit more Samsung news. We told you earlier this year about Samsung's Gear S smartwatch, which will be available to connect over 3G networks without tethering to a smartphone. Samsung announced today that the Gear S will launch in the U.S. next Friday, November 7th. The watch will be available on AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile. Well, in other news, if you saw the movie Her, starring Scarlett Johansson as the voice of a Siri-like assistant, and Joaquin Phoenix as the man who falls in love with an app, then you know that the virtual assistant in that movie was named Samantha. Now, a new app has emerged for chatting with a Samantha. The difference is that this Samantha is a real person who lives in Brooklyn. The app has a website <laughs> with rules of engagement, which include be nice, keep your mind out of the gutter, and most importantly, don't fall in love with Samantha. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Tyler Raymond in Washington State, who, at least for this picture, watched the show while controlling the video on his Moto 360. That is pretty cool. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we'll find it. That is the tech news today. Elise Hugh, thank you so much for your awesome co-anchoring. 
Always glad to be here, and I'll see you next Thursday. All right, see you next Thursday. Well, you can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, RSS. So many options. Choose your favorite at twit.tv slash TNT. Follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Join our Google Plus community. Just search Google Plus for Tech News Today and you'll find it. And please send us your thoughts and opinions by email, tnt at twit.tv, or phone, 260-TNT-SHOW. And don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight right here on the Twit Network. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.